Today on the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with Will Coleman. Now, Will is the founder and CEO of Urban Gate Capital, and Will is responsible for all the operations and investor relations. Now, prior to starting Urban Gate Capital, Will has many years of experience in investing in Tennessee and in Texas. In addition, Will has worked as a credit analyst at Citibank and has been a director of finance at Rand Capital, a mortgage lending brokerage company um, based in Texas, I believe. But I'm really excited and pumped to have him on the show today to share his incredible knowledge and and experience with us, but enough of me. Let's get him out here. G'day, Will. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today, mate? I'm doing great. How are you, Reed? Good. Thank you very much, my friend. Um, where are you doling in from today? I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee. Awesome. Love that part of the world. Yeah, it's a fun uh, place to be. You probably know some people that I know as well out there. Uh, yeah. Hol- Holland Day Ventures, Evan Holiday. Yeah, I know Evan. Yeah, yep. good good, good guy, really good guy. So um, I actually just, just ran into him at the bar like two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> out, out doing good networking, I assume. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was like... I was with one other guy and I was like, was this planned? He goes, no, we're just here. I was like, great. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Will, with that being said, can you rewind the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid? Yeah. So I, I haven't really ever been asked that. So I had to think about it. Um, but I, 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 my first dollar I do think was not necessarily a garage sale, but like I set up a table in my front yard when I was probably – Oof, I was probably like six or seven or something like that. And I would just things in my house that I, no, none, none of our family wanted, I would put on a table and try and sell to people walking down the street. <laughs> and I remember I sold, I made like $30 or something like that. And I used Good. that to buy a subscription to a Yu-Gi-Oh magazine that I, I was obsessed with Yu-Gi-Oh. Mm. Um, I was, I was selling things like my sister's toys and all kinds of things. So that, that was my first, first dollar. Awesome. Bring us into the story of how you've come to start Urban Gate Capital. We're speaking in the bit of the green room prior, prior to press and record. You've got a lot of experience prior to that. So what's this? What's the journey into entrepreneurship? Yeah, so I, I think like probably like yourself, Reed, and, and like many entrepreneurs, I've, I've known I was an entrepreneur since I was like 10 years old. Uh, you just you just can't help it. Um, but I I, I had a real estate, I had a job at a real estate bank in Texas. And after that, I got um, an opportunity to work uh, at a company called Rand Capital, which is with Jake and Gino, who you may be familiar with. Yes, I And am. that was, it, it was, I wasn't starting a company from scratch, but I was helping them build a company. And so I went from like a, a traditional W-2 job to helping people build a company. And so I, I did that for about two years, and that was the mortgage brokerage and I learned all the lessons of what you need to do to build a business. But for some, like that, that business just wasn't, I, I kept running into more walls than I feel like you should as like growing a business is already incredibly difficult, mm-hmm. but this seemed insanely more difficult than it should be. So I, I kind of, after a couple of years, I sat down and I was like, why is this business not working? And then how can I build a business that doesn't run into these same problems? And that's, what was kind of the origin of, of Urban Gate Capital. And at the time I was a commercial mortgage broker and Urban Gate Capital is a, is a hard money lender. So um, I made the jump from RAND to start Urban Gate after kind of looking at the principles that I learned from not a failed business, we were successful, but it was, I was like, why is this so hard? Mm. And I took those lessons and used that to start my, uh, my new venture, which is Urban Gate. Well, Jake and Jen are good friends of the show. I've had both of them on before. They're awesome. <laughs> uh, and I, 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 I was the MC at one of their first ever conferences back in the day. So, yeah, good big shout out to the boys. Um, was that what, in Nashville? No, that was, uh, was that Nashville? That was in the one in Knoxville, uh, one oh, of like the first yeah. ever ones back in the day. Um, I think it's 16, 17. I can't remember. So yeah. uh, I did go to the one in Nashville and I did speak at that one. So, um, but what, you know, talk to me about what, what, what failed. Um, you know, you don't have to tell me all, all the goss, but, but what no. was, <laughs> what was, what, what didn't work? What, what walls were you running into in terms of that company? Maybe just describe for the listeners what the company was in order to, you know, give some context here. Yeah. So, um, and it, the company didn't fail. I, I shouldn't have 
phrased it like that. It, it was actually profitable. We were making money and, and we were we had customers and we had business. Um, so what the company was, it was a mortgage brokerage, mm. uh, specifically for multifamily. So Reed, you and probably a lot of your listeners um, purchase multifamily properties. When you get a, a deal under contract, you get it financed through a bank, through Fannie, Fannie and Freddie, through a bridge lender, a private lender, wh- whatever it may be. And what we did is we were a broker. So if you, uh, we brokered debt. So we didn't provide debt specifically, but you could come to us and we would say, hey, here's four quotes. Here's a bank quote. Here's a bridge quote. Here's an agency quote. Which one do you want to go with? Um, and then the customer would would pick the best option and, and choose that option. And we would broker between the person purchasing the property and 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 the lender. And we just had a, a large book of business, a lot of relationships in the debt space. And um, the main challenge I would say is, and it, it's not that this business can't flourish, but I I just got tired of being the middleman. Really, mm. is was kind of the, the best way to sum it up of. You know, like the, 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 my client, the person who's purchasing the property, they could, not that this really happened, but they had the ability to go, once we worked with that lender one time, they could just call that lender directly the second time. Right. Um, so that, the, like, I kind of had the realization that my clients would eventually outgrow me. And I, I wanted to have clients that would come to me consistently and over 10 to 20 years. Um, so that, that was a big lesson is, uh, I, I wanted to be in a business where my customers would be long-term customers, not one that once they use me a couple of times would go and, and source the debt, uh, directly. Uh, the second lesson, and this is really the main one I would say is that a debt broker provides value. It is helpful, but it's not like insanely valuable, meaning mm-hmm. like, it's not a needed. It's not a needed product. It's it's more of a like. It'd be nice to get a couple other quotes, but, but most operators like yourself, they already kind of know their lenders are. They um, they've got a good relationships with multiple lenders, so they're like, yeah, I've got my guys. Can you provide a quote? Can you provide some extra quotes? Okay, cool. Like those are good. We'll think about it. And so, I wanted to have a product like a a. a Whatever my product was at the time, I didn't know it would go into this space, but I wanted to have a product that people are like, wow, that's that's really good. <laughs> like, I like that. Let's do that. Uh, and that they could have that product for as long as they're in business. So those are really the main two things that frustrated me at um, at, at the brokerage business. Yep. And is Rand still operational? I assume, assume they are. I don't think so. I, I think they've more so just... Um, They've got like a referral program set up because they have all those students. So they'll, yep. they'll just refer their students to that, that book of business that we lent out and then they'll get yep. um, some compensation through that. Yeah. No, I, I could I, just knowing Jake and Gino personally, it, it'd, be, it'd make sense with what they've built to, to go and try and start a whole, you know, brokerage company but it's you know in itself it's a very difficult thing to do, right? And you get a little bit of shiny object syndrome. So it's sort of like, uh, but not not necessarily as a bad thing. It's just it, you, you yeah. go and you go and scratch that itch. It may or may not work out, and but at least you scratched it. So, um, talk to me about what you then pivoted into. Urban Gate Capital. So you got these challenges. You you worried about people going around you. How do you solve that in the in the real estate investing space? So you don't you are providing value. Yeah. Um, so it. The origin of Urban Gate really starts with my business partner. His name is Brandon Thornberry. Um, uh, he, uh, he's been investing in Nashville for 15 years. He's flipped 100 houses. He owns um, a, a probably four to 500 units in apartment complex uh, in multifamily. And so he'd been very successful in the real estate investing space. And he started lending out his own personal cash to people who were flipping houses. Um, so buddies of his friends of his that he know in the house flipping industry, he would lend them on a two month note, a six month note, um, the capital to flip the house. And at the time I knew him just in the real estate space and we were talking and he was like, man, there's a real demand for these short term loans for people who are flipping houses. He, He was surprised by the amount of demand for these types of loans. And he very quickly ran out of his own capital. Um, so while I was kind of in this headspace at Rand and, and looking at other options, 
I went to him and I was like, well, what if we raised capital and launched a fund uh, in order to, uh, we'd raise capital and then use that capital to lend out to people flipping houses, the same network that you've been working with. And uh, that was uh, just under two years ago. And um, we've been growing since then. So in, in the last two years, we've raised probably about $13 million and we've done loan, we've lent out probably about 25 million um, since since we've started. And what type of, uh, just curious, because I'm interested in the green room before we press record here, I, part of, and if you go back to some episodes that I've interviewed on this particular podcast, one gentleman in particular um, was uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Ep- Episcope, who's from Origin Investments in Chicago, big multifamily firm. And one of the things I remember he always said to me is like, we're in, we're in three businesses. We buy, we sell, we lend. And mm-hmm. I was like, tell me about the lending. And he, and he, he went down this rabbit hole of, well, we don't ha- we needed a product to, you know, make sure our investors when they come to us between these bigger deals that may only happen four or five, six times a year, you've got something to, to offer them in between. So they're not waiting all the time. Mm-hmm. Lo and behold, all of a sudden, I start seeing this common thread. Brian Burke is another gentleman. I network with him very closely. He's been on this podcast. And all of a sudden, I started to see these, these bigger guys, you know, make, you know, buying deals are fantastic. And that's the that's the, the nucleus of their business. Right. But they needed something else to offer their clients in order to keep, when they came through the door, there wasn't just nothing. Oh, sorry, we, got, we just closed on a deal. You missed out. And we might have one, another one in three or four months' time. Three or four months' time comes around. The money's not there, right? So it is a very interesting concept to create that ecosystem of you're buying deals, you're selling deals, which is the, the main nucleus, but then you've got this other arm of the lending. So, and I just say that is more like, because I'm interested in it, right? Right. Um, and, and like like Jake and Gino, I've got a, I've got a curious mind and, and and do I need to go and, you know, start that business all on its own? But but, I, but I've seen other people, Passive Investing do, do it as well, right? They've got, a, I think, Flip Wallet, yep. I think the name is, and they raised a Re- fund. Rehab around. Wallet. Yeah. Rehab wallet, rehab wallet. So yeah. Yep. So, 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 so you mentioned thirteen million, um, and I actually was just looking up Brandon Thornberry. He's on. Is he Quattro Capital as well? So he's done some deals with with, with Quattro. Quattro. Got it. Yeah. Because I, I just inter- interviewed um, one of the guys on, from Quattro on the show literally like two weeks ago. Oh, um, nice. So thirteen million you've raised. Mm-hmm. What's the you mentioned you've lent out twenty. So what, what? Walk me. What's the? That doesn't make any sense. You only you only got thirteen. Do what? What? How do you? What do you go do to 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 do to connect the the rest of it? Yeah. So um, when we lend the money out, we're, it's, we we personally love short term loans. So like our at, uh, today our our average loan term, I think is one hundred and seven days. Wow. So we are if like if we raise a million dollars from you, Reed. Mm-hmm. Our goal is to lend that out, get it back, lend it out, get it back, lend it out, get it back three times in one year. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be, if we did it three times, that would be killing it. So mm-hmm. as, as of right now, we're just over, you know, we're probably like 2.2 times. Um, but that's our goal is to to lend that money out three times um, within one year. So that's how we've been able to raise around, uh, I don't know the exact number, I'm, I'm kind of s- uh, yeah. averaging out to 13 million. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then our loan volume is about twenty five million because we'll we'll, we'll use that capital multiple times. Got it. So you're not because I do know there's other. You can go out and speaking to people like Brian Burke, you can raise fifty percent of the money, i.e. thirteen million, and then you can go get a warehouse line of credit. That means that your overall mm-hmm. lending pool is you know you 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 your, your warehouse line is you know at a cheap rate combined with what you're giving your investors on the equity side, you can lend, you know, say it's 6% and then it's, it's 2% on your line of credit, you know, you're lending out at eight or nine, there's an arbitrage there, you can take the delta. That's how I understand, you know, a, a, an element of the business, or you can just purely raise the money yourself, you're self-funded and don't have any warehouse line. But that is yep. how bigger banks do do it, correct? If I'm, if, correct me if I'm uh, asking. That's exactly right. And, um, Every bigger operator I've asked for advice, they all say, go get a warehouse line of credit. Mm. <laughs> like anytime I talk to someone, it's like, okay, here's what we've done. Here's our team. Here's our scope. Here's our average, you know, weekly volume, et cetera. What should we be doing next? And everyone has said, go get a, a warehouse line of credit. I, I can be a bit of a control freak. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't like the, I, like a warehouse line of credit. 
I, I'll admit I'm I don't know exactly what they'll do, but I'm sure they'll have a little bit more red tape. So right. they'll want right. they'll want certain documentation. I have to get to get approval on each deal, or and maybe it's not that bad. Um, but I I just love the fact that like we have 100 percent control, control of what yep. we let funds out. The only, can do all sorts of creative stuff, yeah. The, the only problem there is you're limited to $13 million, right? You want to go do bigger loan sizes. You know, you've got someone's yep. come along and you say, hey, I've got a $7 million acquisition. I want to do, you know, a $5 million, you know, loan. Well, guess what? That's that's only nearly – it's 40% of, of, of your bank of, – of your balance sheet. So the idea of getting that, it's it's – that, you know, just from for the listeners out there, it's it, it, you know, the loan, the line of credit will help build up that book of business so you can lend bigger amounts uh, yes. quicker. So yeah, yeah, and I, I think I've, I'm starting to come to the conclusion like let's go get the line of credit even if we don't use it, let's right. have it. Right, um, right. and that that's, I think that's going to be you know a big goal for the next year. Yeah, so. Tell me how you're then you know, with the business. How you're building it from a soup to nuts in 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 the, in the sense that like how you're finding your lenders, right? Because today's world is different lending environment, and and I would I would argue to say that I think the Freddie average thirty year mortgage is around six and a half seven percent, yep. which is uh, I know that I've lent at hard money le- levers before. That's it's approaching you know eight percent hard money you know type of rates. So. How are you handling that right now? When when the when the common st- on the street everyday blue collar, so not blue collar, blue chip lenders are lending at nearly same interest rates th- as you guys, are, or are your interest rates now pushing up to say ten percent? So I, our interest rate has st- has stayed the same. Um, we are uh, uh, a little bit higher than eight <laughs> percent. So we're at, we lend at twelve percent. And then we'll do two to three points on the origination side. Mm-hmm. And what's what's exciting about that? So let, let's say it's three points, twelve percent, three points. That's fifteen percent. If we're able to lend that capital three times in one year, it all of a sudden becomes we're earning eighteen percent on. Um, mm-hmm. Because uh, you get oh, no, sorry. But yeah, it would be slightly more because we're getting a three points three times. Not three times um, that'd be like nearly over twenty yeah. percent. Yep. Yeah. So the um, it'd be twenty one percent. Twenty one percent. Yep. My mental math is not great, I'll admit. But um, so that's that's why our goal is to, to cycle it so many times. But um, to answer your question, our rates have stayed the same. Our rates were twelve and three a year ago, and that's what they are today. Mm-hmm. And it's it's made it significantly easier to say those rates out loud, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Because uh, when we were lending at twelve and three, the bank's loans were three percent, mm-hmm. um, three four percent. And now they're eight percent, seven percent, and we're still at twelve. So mm-hmm. all, all of a sudden, twelve sounds much more affordable to people. Um, and so we, I mean, we just have slightly more negotiation power when we're talking to borrowers. Right. Um, and then, and the question you asked: So, where are we finding our borrowers? I, I will, I'll admit to you, I was extremely lucky to partner with Brandon. Because he's been flipping houses for so long in Nashville, he's got a huge network of people who flip houses. So anytime someone, I've talked to a handful of people that are wanting to start this type of business, that's that's always their biggest struggle is mm. where do I meet people to lend the funds to? Right. Um, yeah, how, how do I get it on the by- street? Exactly. Yeah. So I, I was lucky to be able to tap into his network where he could say, hey, here's 20 people that I know want to borrow our, our money. Mm. Um, so that for someone starting out, that takes time to build up and you could probably partner with people in the area and things like that. But, um, that's how we found our network is we were lucky enough to have be tapped into that, to Brandon's network. And then, yeah, just as rates have increased, our terms seem that much more affordable. Um, Mm. we, we are getting some pressure from investors to increase our rates, um, Mm. but we haven't felt the need to as of yet. Um, but I, I could see that if we continue in this direction, I could see that happening. It's interesting you say that because I would, I would have thought that, you know, twelve percent, you would have, you'd be generating more business today than you would be, say, twelve months ago. When, 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 when Freddie's at three and you're at twelve, why the hell would I come to you? Because, and I also know as a borrower of hard money in the past, I'm like, I could probably get seven or eight somewhere else. You know, so yeah. how have you? How does 12 justify is what I'm probably asking. Mm. 
Yeah, it it is a good question. I think I would argue we are the easiest, fastest, and most convenient lender in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think like we may have some competition, but we're we're top. We're in the top five in Nashville, like out of everyone. Um, Like, I I guess maybe if you have an uncle or a family member that doesn't even care about the property and just wires you two hundred grand without asking, they'll beat us. But um, so, like uh, for example. A lot of our competition that lends at seven, eight, nine percent, they've probably increased rates a little bit over the last six months. So they might be closer to nine, ten percent now, where we stayed the same. But also a lot of those guys are based out of California, they're based out of Philadelphia, they're based out of you know different areas, and they have to get appraisals. They've got it, they need a little bit more time to close. They they don't really know the market that well. Whereas in Nashville, we're local. Our teams here in Nashville. Uh, Brandon has been here for a long time. It's very common that um, someone will call us for a deal and Brandon will be like, oh yeah, I used to own that property. <laughs> or like, <laughs> I, I own a property on the same street. So we can approve deals much faster than almost right. anyone can. Right. And we're willing to go a little right. bit higher on leverage because we understand the risk a little bit better. So we're, we'll fund a little bit higher in the leverage. We can close faster. We know the deal's just better um, because again of, of Brandon, like he's a, he's a serious advantage on our team. Um, so like borrowers call us and we're saying like, we're, sometimes we're advising them on the deal because we know the deal's better than they do. Right. So that's a long, long winded answer. Right. The real answer is speed. We can close, someone can call us and say, Hey, I've got to close this deal in three days. Can you do it? And we, we don't like to do that, but we can. I, I remember my first fix and flip in Philadelphia back in 2013. I l- used a local bank. I can't even remember who it was, but it essentially was a hard money lender, right? And uh, the guy who ran it would be the guy who would come and tour the property. You know, he'd know the area uh, and, and get you know, then have his assistant sort of you know f- figure us out the the uh, the mortgage or the the, the note. And mm-hmm. you know, that would that would be it, right? And and I know I'll just talking to a lot of other hard money lenders around the country, around you know, I now live in LA. I've I do business you know in Texas and Greenville and Phoenix. It is local, being local and speed is is really sort of that cost of capital. They can you can swallow. Okay, yeah, you're twelve. I probably could get an eight or a nine somewhere, but it might take me an extra two weeks. I need to close to you know this week. So it's it's sort of just, you know, it's, it's short term pain for long term gain if you're getting a really smoking hot deal. Uh but 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 you know, by and large I see a lot of the hard money lenders focusing really local on their area. So yeah. Even actually the house it's I live a- in today, you know, we we bought this is not built in nineteen twelve in Los Angeles. Uh, was going to get, you know, I work for my, I'm self-employed. So you know getting a, a, a regular loan is very tough. And yeah. I remember we, we put about Three hundred thousand dollars into this house to, fi- to flip it, uh, to, to do it up, and yeah, the, I had to go get a hard money eight uh, percent as as COVID hit. You know, all the, the warehouse lines of credit you know went away, and uh, I had to ring up a guy and you know put it in my business name and pretend that like oh yeah I'm not moving into it. And he's like he's, 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 he's looking he's looking at the numbers like hey, these these numbers don't work, dude. And I was like okay, it's a personal house. Like come on. <laughs> like I, I've got you. You you know you know me for a long period of time and. It, it just things you got to do to to make to make it work. So yeah, um, it's uh, it, it's a definitely interesting business. What what is what are some of the the biggest things that you get pushback from investors? And how are we actually finding investors? It probably is the other question coming into the fund. What are you doing and, and offering? I'm assuming the twelve percent interest rate. You know, are you paying the full twelve to investors, or are you doing a split with them? So we pay them a flat eight yep. uh, percent. it's a it's a flat eight percent through monthly distribution, and it's. Um, yeah, so the, the way the fund is set up is it's a 8% preferred return through a monthly distributions. We we have a six month hold period. So you have to leave your funds in for at least at least six months. And then after that, you can withdraw that capital on a 90 days notice. Yep. So it's um a flat percent, but you have the ability to withdraw your capital. Depending on how soon you withdraw, there there, there might be some withdrawal penalties. Um, but you do have the capability to withdraw the capital. Within 90 um, days, yep. Yep. 
Yep. No, it's, it sounds like every single everyone I keep talking to, I'm starting to get all these ideas, and it's the same. It's the same thing. You know, like you're offering yeah. liquidity, you're offering your you know, first first lien. So if anything goes yep. wrong, you, you, the only disadvantage of that is you know the triangle of liquidity, appreciation, or whatever the other thing is, is that you don't get the tax benefits because you're sitting in the first position. So That's exactly right. Yep. There, 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 is a, there is a downside for those listeners out there listening, but there is a way to be that you get your money working for you, for you in the short term when you're waiting for that big multifamily deal or that big commercial deal to come through with with a particular uh, group in order to then invest in that and make, you know, Good multiples on your money. Um, yep. Very, very interesting stuff. So, what are you what are you looking to do in the next sort of six to twelve months? And where are you seeing investors' appetite right now? Are they still wanting to 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 lend? And and are you still seeing fix and flipping happening right now, given where we are? Yeah. So I'll start with the last question because that kind of yields what everything else looks like. Of um, the our deal volume in terms of the requests we're getting for fix and flips is certainly slowing down. I mean, um, the a lot of people are just kind of like, I'm just selling everything now. I'm not trying to buy anything. Um, I'm, I'm offloading my books or I'm taking a break or I'm, I'm, I'm trying to buy for long term. Like everyone knows valuations are going down. And I'm a big believer in as long as the cost of capital is going up, valuations are going down. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. a lot of people don't necessarily want to flip something in a market where valuations are going down. That being said, deals are still happening. There just has to be a lot more meat on the deal. Like you have to be getting it at a a severe discount or it's got to be a really unique situation. Um, So the deals are still happening, uh, but it it is certainly slowing down. And with that, um, obviously, not only is the deal slowing down, but we as an underwriting perspective are being more careful on the deals we lend on. Uh, so just just in October, we had a 50% fund rate, meaning that we turned down um, one out of every two deals that was sent our way. Um, so really? we're still very risk averse. Yeah. Yep. Um, hmm. Which I, 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 it, before we started tracking that number, I would have thought we were funding much higher. But after we started tracking, I was like, okay, well, we actually are pretty conservative in terms of the deals we're doing. Um so yeah, on, on that end, it is it is slowing down, but it is still happening. And in a market as busy as Nashville, there's always a need for capital. Like a lot of our deals aren't just fix and flip. Like some are very unique where someone needs to buy land or they need to refinance a, an investment property so they can close on another deal. And um, there, there's a handful of unique situations that still require capital. And like the past 30 days have been a good example of that where the deals aren't as straightforward as they were six months ago of just buy it, paint it, sell it. The deals are becoming a little more like unique situations, but people are still finding ways to get deals done. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the, on the investor side, there's a handful of different perspectives that investors are taking. Like some investors are saying, I'm, I'm completely out. Uh, I, I don't want to put any money to work. Like I'm on pause. Some investors are Hey, I've got half, you know, I've got half a million dollars in my 401k. I want to, I want to, or a self-directed IRA. I, I don't want to be in the stock market. I want to put all of that with you. And then some investors are, I'm losing money in everything else. If you can say you can get an eight percent preferred return, uh, I'll take that all day. Uh, and then some are saying, well, I can put money in a treasury and earn two to three percent. Like, why would I risk it and go an eight percent in a month? Right. I'm like, you know, I'd say the majority of people are like half are kind of in that risk averse space and half are in that. I don't want to be in the stock market anymore. Mm -hmm. I'd rather put my funds with you. Got it. Um, So that, that kind of summarizes that. How how are you finding your investors? Are are you doing online advertising? Are you trying to, you know, word of mouth? Uh, What what are you doing? Um, Because obviously proofs in the pudding, right? You start paying out monthly distributions. Everyone's like, this is bloody great. I'll, you know, tell around the water cooler, tell uh, Jim and Bob and Carol about these boys. Yeah. Most of it is, it started with me and Brandon just calling our network. Um, We've been able to raise a a pretty healthy amount just from the people that we knew, you know, like my time in the Jake and Gino community, his time uh, uh, partnering with people and buying deals. And then it, it, from there, it's mostly been word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So we've had a, a bunch of referrals, a bunch of investors that, um, 
have had success with us and they'll refer it to their friends. And I'm, I would imagine that's probably similar to you, Reed, of like you can, you, you touch base with your network. And then once you succeed with them, they tell their friends and it grows from there. And that's, that's how it's mostly been. We, we've we raised some fr- funds from podcasts and online, but less than, you know, less than 5%, I'd say. Yep. yep. In terms of what I was saying before about the, the, the ecosystem of the buy, the sell, the lend, have you seen that successfully roll out with other groups from scratch? Like I know I, I, like we mentioned passive investing before. We mentioned Brian Burke. We mentioned uh, Origin Capital. But have you seen it ever just you know roll into, or you've been asked? Am I the first person who's asked? Say I've got an existing you know commercial you know investing you know platform, and I want to add this element to it. Yeah, I, I do think passive investing is the best example I've seen. Um, I think Dan does a great job of like he's built like a a whole network of investment options, mm. uh, which is really incredible. Um, so that, that's the best example I've seen of it. I do think it's a really good fit. And kind of what we were talking about earlier is a lot of our investors are people that are buying or invest like our LPs that are investing in real estate deals and they want to put their money to work in between doing those investments. That's, that's, pro- that's probably like 75% of our investor base. Right. It's to understand real estate. They've got a, a handful amount of cash and they don't want it sitting in a bank account and they're waiting to buy another multifamily deal. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a ton of synergies there. I, I, th- I do think passive investing is the best example I've seen of that. Um, and then we've been approached by a couple uh, groups like yours to like kind of do what we do under their brand. Right, like a white, uh, like a white quite, label. <laughs> yeah, we haven't quite found the right fit. And again, it, it comes down to what I said about like, I want to be in control. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, um, but it, yeah, it, it does seem to naturally have a natural synergy to it, I would say mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, awesome stuff. What, last question before we get into the lightning round. Where are you seeing the next 12 months both in the economy mm. and where you want to take the business? Great question. Yeah, so right now, uh, so we launched our fund in July. Uh, prior to launching the fund, we've just been doing individual deals with investors, um, kind of like syndicating each loan almost. Uh, so we launched the fund in July. Right now, we're still pretty small in the fund. We're at two million that we've raised through the fund. Uh, by the end of 2023, we'd like to be at 10 million. Mm-hmm. So we'd like to, to 5x the capital in our fund by the end of 2023. Um, with that being said, I'm I'm also very conscious of the in market environment we're in now, and I, I don't want to raise a bunch of money into a you know a worsening economy. So we'll be very careful in terms of the amount of capital we raise and, and making sure we're doing that in a responsible way. But that's the goal is raise, raise 10 million uh, through the fund. And so again, with that, then it would be a $30 million loan volume. So that's our goal is $10 million raise, $30 million loan volume. And then in terms of the economy, I, I, I don't necessarily know. I don't think anyone knows, but I, I think to me, it's very simple. As, as long as the cost of capital is going up, values are going down. Um, and there'll be a, the, you know, the pendulum is swinging. And even once the cost of capital, so once, even as interest rates are climbing, even when it levels off, there's still going to be a correction effect. So valuations will keep going down. But I'm pretty much purely operating by the concept of don't fight the Fed. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's really the only thing I'm paying attention to. So if, as long as the Fed is increasing rates, the econ- economic situation is going to get worse. Once they stop, once they pause and start going down, it's going to get better. And I, I don't really try and overcomplicate it after, over that. Right. And I think the, the only thing you can do, at least in my two cents, is you've got to keep hanging around the hoop. You've got to keep underwriting deals because there's going to be deals still to be had out there. It's just, you, you just got to, you can make money in any market. You just got to keep doing the work. Don't, don't just be pencils down and do nothing. So Absolutely. things can get done in today's environment and, and, and you can actually kind of pick up some some nice sweetheart deals in in these times. So I think that's that's a at least a message for what I'm telling everyone. <laughs> so, yeah. Keep like optimistic. It. So yeah, with, yeah, that, with that being sure. said, uh, let's get into the top five investing tips. You ready to get into it? Let's get it. Mate, question number one, what's a daily habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals? Uh, meditation, I'd say. Yep. You do. What do you? What sort of meditation are you doing? 
So I, I, med- I do transcendental med- meditation yep. every morning, um, 15 to 20 minutes every, every morning. And, um, it's done wonders for my, like my mental capabilities, just in terms of staying calm and not uh, overreacting to situations, especially in a position of leadership, like, um, controlling my emotions and things like that. It, meditation is, um, incredibly valuable. Yeah. I, 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 I do it. I'm a big student of it as well. I've just had a new baby. It hasn't been, the mornings are a little different now. Uh, yeah. So laying on the floor in the middle of the living room and meditating for 15 minutes <laughs> is, uh, is, is a luxury that's it's long gone, but we'll get back into it eventually. But no, uh, I, I, okay. do, I, I do love that. Congrats on the newborn. Thank you so much. Uh, question number two is, who's been the most influential person in your career to date? Mm. I know these are fire rounds. I'm supposed to do them quickly, but I have to think about that. Man, that's tough. There's, there's definitely a handful. Um, it's, it'd be hard to pick one. I, it, it's kind of cheesy, but I guess I'd have to say my dad. <laughs> fun. Uh, he, uh, he was the original person that put me onto real estate. And um, I, I'd say the biggest lesson I learned from him was uh, in, you know, just integrity, integrity and being true to your word. And um, that has been an extremely important guiding factor. So it, I, there's plenty more that I could choose from, but I'd, I'd probably stick with him. Love it. Uh, I, I, I point to my dad as, or my parents is at least the same same thing. Uh, yeah. Question number three is in your business, what's the most influential tool? And when I say tool, it could be a notebook, a phys- like a physical tool, like a notebook or a, a cell phone, or it's a piece of software that you just can't run the business without. What is it? Uh, uh, so we use Asana mm-hmm. is what I would say. And we have a, I mean, my team probably gets annoyed of how system oriented I am, but we have a, uh, a 62 step process for every loan we do. And it's, there's everyone gets assigned a task in the sauna and it, uh, it's beautiful. <laughs> 62 steps. It's a lot of steps. Yeah. It, it hopefully it might be less, but when I first made it, it was 62. Um, I, I'll, ch- I'll challenge you to be like, if I, if I was a partner, I'd be like, dude, let's get down that, that down to 10. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's the goal. Yeah. It's definitely the goal is, is to reduce as much as possible, but yeah. yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Question uh, number four is in one sentence, what's been the biggest failure in your career? what did you learn from that failure? Failure. Um, I, I mean, I guess it's one sentence. My biggest failure was uh, trying to start a company that didn't add enough value to its clients. Mm -hmm. And making sure that if you're going to start a business, you're, you're providing a tremendous amount of value. I love that. Adding value to your clients. Yep. Yep. I love it. Last question, mate, is where can people reach you to continue the conversation? They want to be in your sphere. Where do they go? Yeah. So uh, our website, urbangatecapital.com. If you're interested in being an investor, there's an invest, uh, invest button. And then my email is will at urbangatecapital.com. Um, will at urbangatecapital.com. Just shoot me an email. Awesome stuff, my friend. Well, look, I want to thank you so much for jumping on the show today. I just want to reflect some of the things I took away from today's show. I think, look, thank you for being open and honest about how the the, the business works, right? It's it's a it's a it's a it's interesting. I'm definitely personally interested with my company at RSM Property Group offering a lending arm at some point in the future, and I'm seeing it through other people that we've just spoke about, you know, at length uh, throughout the show. Um, but that, that last statement that you made about you know tr- adding value to a company. And tying that back to what the lessons you learned with it coming out of Rand Capital, not that it was, it was a problem, but just that you saw that you were um, dispensable at some point, you know, being that middleman, being a broker, you know, of debt, it, it's just like I can go around you at any point. And how do you provide a true service? Because debt brokers, you know, it's like a commodity. Everyone, everyone seems to be doing it. Um, so I think having those lessons and then t- taking it into your business to create something that you knew would work because you saw the need there, but you just needed to tweak. Yeah, just give it a little bit of a tweak, a little bit of oil around those rusty parts and get rid of those, you know, those barriers, those walls that you're running into at the previous firm and just making it a little bit more user-friendly and customer orientated, which I think is extremely important. Um, but did I leave anything out in that little summary? No, that was that was very impressive. Well done. Awesome. Awesome, my friend. Well, look, again, thank you so much for jumping on the show. Enjoy the rest of your week. Hopefully we'll catch up soon at a at a conference here or there, and um, we'll talk, we'll talk very, very soon. Sounds great. Thanks, Reed.
Well, there you have another cracking episode jam-packed with some incredible stuff from Will. If you do, are you, if you are interested in lending or you're getting into the lending space, head over to urbancapital.com. You want to invest there, short-term capital, talking about the two times, two and a half, three times the use of a money in a given calendar year. I think that was really, really key from terms of the business model of it. Um, and yeah, check it out, check that out at Will, uh, sorry, urbancapital.com. It's also will at urbancapital.com. Uh, I want to thank everyone for taking some time out of their day to tune in to continue to grow your your, your financial IQ because that's what we're all about here on this show. If you do like this show, the easiest way to give back is to give it a five-star review on iTunes. All the links from today's show will be up on my website at readgoosensgood.com. And we're going to do this all again next week. So remember, be bold, be brave, and go give life a crack. 